Yeah, what's up, girl? <laughs> she had to come from, from underneath the shadow of her father. I don't exist well just being famous. That doesn't give me any sort of satisfactory feeling. Lisa Marie Presley, now on Biography. The tabloids like me. I don't know what their deal is with There's me. There's nothing, quote, normal about being a Presley. I can, you know, I mean, let's be honest. She was born famous. I couldn't imagine that. She's really, really sweet with her children. When it's come to men, uh, you know, it's been hard to monitor sometimes, you know, because she had her history. Can you imagine having, you know, every boyfriend you've ever had, you know, documented in the press? I don't think she really got the magnitude of her situation until she married Michael Jackson. I am some source of interest to them. I don't know why. She's just like her father. I remember her calling me one day and she said, I think I can sing. <laughs> <laughs> to all of a sudden decide at such a late age that you're going to be a musician and a singer, it takes a lot of balls. It shows a lot of promise to, you know, to have a gold record first time out. Whatever is thought of as cool or whatever, I hate it immediately. <laughs> Elvis Presley and Priscilla Beaulieu were married in May 1967. Nine months later, on February 1st, 1968, they became the proud parents of Lisa Marie Presley, the only child of the king of rock and roll. I'll never forget that day when I get a call early in the morning from Elvis on the intercom. And Elvis says to me, <laughs> I don't want you to get nervous or anything, but I think Priscilla's got to go to the hospital. So let's all meet in the kitchen. So I get dressed. And we had done a couple of trial runs uh, to the hospital because we knew it was going to be a big press thing. And so uh, we go to the kitchen. Elvis is so calm. He's walking around and talking about everybody stay calm. And I hear this noise outside in the front of the house. And it's Priscilla by the car going, Elvis, I've got to go. Here's this guy that was the bachelor of the century, right? He's in there and he's, you know, just talking about babies and he's all excited. Uh, Lisa's born. And you would think Elvis uh, had been a father all of his life. He's holding her the next day. Elvis and Priscilla really wanted the press to see Lisa. I mean, they were so proud. And uh, it was the happiest time. And I've seen Elvis happy. It was the happiest time I've ever seen Elvis in my life was the day Lisa was born. She seemed to be quite content and a very, you know, very, very happy child. A vicious little girl. <laughs> You know, she was. She was a happy child. Elvis was an incredibly loving human being and demonstrated that more with his little girl than just about anybody. I mean, he really doted on her. He adored her. He was inordinately affectionate and loving and kind and permissive. Graceland was very much like Disneyland for her. We had golf carts and not a lot of restrictions. <laughs> what a place to grow up. <laughs> I think life here at Graceland was probably an, a, a, an endless childhood birthday party for Lisa. Yes, she said, you want to go for a ride? And yeah. I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. So she gets in the driver's seat, and I said, you're not driving that, are you? <laughs> oh, yes, the, I drive it all the time. And I said, oh, I don't think so, Lisa. And all of a sudden, boom. <laughs> She's driving that thing. I mean, it's slow. She's really speeding up all around the place. I kept on saying, now, Lisa, you don't have to go that fast. She said, I'm not going fast. Lisa is a soul sister. And the public, they don't know that she was basically raised by, you know, uh, blacks in, in Memphis, uh, in the house. That was, so she just got a whole lot of soul. These sisters who used to cook and used to babysit her and clean and whatnot. And they would tell us, oh, yeah, Lisa was bossy. Since she came out of her mother's womb, she was just bossy. She'd try to tell us what to do, and we'd pretend and let her go along and make like she was in control. Stuff that other people wouldn't say to Elvis, you know, Lisa would. <laughs> I mean, there were certain times that people would be afraid to say something to Lisa because she, they'd be afraid that Lisa would go say something to her father. So she ran the house a little bit for a while. 
where Priscilla had to be the disciplinary. Elvis was fun, and Lisa, were, they were fun together. He'd buy her little mean coats, a uh, nice piece of jewelry, when she was three and four years old. I mean, you know, that's, that's a little too much. So I guess Aunt Priscilla was the opposite. Priscilla wanted to make sure she understood about life and make sure that she do things the right way and don't demand things. And, and that's, that's the difference in the two of them. We had been on tour for, I don't know, two or three weeks. And we were on a private plane. We're flying back to L.A. Santa Monica Airport. And Priscilla and Lisa uh, were at the airport. And Lisa was like two and a half years old. And we get off the plane, and we're walking over to where they are, and I see this little girl running to her dad with tears in her eyes. And I see him, you know, pick her up. I'll never forget that moment. I went to see the two of them playing on the bed, this little daughter and stuff like that. I, those memories stick in my mind all the time. Elvis and Priscilla's marriage, it was tough. You know, tough for Priscilla, definitely, because as anybody who read anything about Elvis knew about Elvis, Elvis loved, uh, he loved women. He really did. And he could have never been a one-woman man, ever, as we all know, you know. A little while later, she realized that he was out uh, having a good time, and she was home uh, taking care of Lisa, so they split up. Even though it was a divorce, I guess, and we still still remark how as they were leaving the courthouse, they were walking out hand in hand. In fact, that's one of the more famous pictures. So in a sense, you know, it was a divorce, I guess that's what it was, but we never really thought about that. I mean, thought of about them because we were still you know, with one another. And occasionally, you know, I'd get a call from Priscilla, you know, would you please not give her your real girl makeup because she brought it home with her and it's all over the sheets. <laughs> so I got an early lesson in parenting. On August 16th, 1977, the world was stunned with the news that Elvis Presley had died and Lisa was left without her daddy. Nine years old is so incredibly young to lose a parent and such a shocking thing for anyone, but particularly having been there at Graceland when they found his body, it had to be just horribly traumatic for her. I will never forget that upstairs up in Elvis's bathroom where we found him, I was there with him trying to revive him and I looked at the front at the door and standing by the doorway was Lisa. And she had the presence of mind to pick up the phone actually and to dial me in Los Angeles and tell me that her father had passed away and then I had to regain my composure in order to pick up the phone after I had thrown it across the room and try to comfort her and tell her how much her father had loved her and what she had meant to his life. You know she was always playing her father's records and singing with them. And I noticed that, I don't know if it was actually the way she felt, but it just seemed like whenever we went over to the house, and we I didn't hear the records being played like they used to be. I do like Lights Out. I, I like that song a lot. So descriptive of her life with her father and of her feelings after his demise was for me the most personally evocative. It was, it was such an astonishingly uh, poetic, kind of metaphoric um, way to talk about it. I thought it was elegantly done and so it's my favorite. It may not be hers. I mean, I've never capitalized on who I am in any way. I've never run around trying to make Presley perfume. I've never, I've never, I've never, I'm not that person instinctively. So a song that makes reference to that part of my life and who I am in, in that way. It's like, for me, I don't, it's a song for me. Um, for others, it's that association of, oh, she's talking about Memphis in the Grave and the damn backyard, that's Graceland, and oh, yeah, that's where her family's buried, and oh, that she's talking about their dad, and she's talking about Graceland and Memphis, and there it is. <laughs> and I can't, for me, it's just a song. And she writes about it in Lights Out. She said, there's a spot there in the backyard for me. And, and I looked to my left, and there was this spot. People don't have a clue the weight. Mm -hmm. 
They don't have a clue the weight that she holds on these shoulders of hers, this little five foot three blowhole that she is. And I was really looking for something for myself and for my daughter then, because of course we just had this horrible tragedy, losing her father, and, and I was searching for something to give me strength to, to move on. The Church of Scientology, founded by L. Ron Hubbard, is an applied religious philosophy which uses courses and a practice called auditing to help its members better understand themselves. Gabe Kaplan, who was the star of uh, Welcome Back, Cotter, the TV show I was doing, he played the teacher, and uh, he was friends with um, Priscilla. And he said to me, you know, um, you know, as you know, Elvis died recently, and Priscilla would really like to meet you. She has some questions she wants to ask you. The crux of the conversation was uh, you seem to have um, survived all the things that my, my ex-husband didn't. He explained to her what Scientology was, and then I think the next day she kind of told me in the car on the way home from school what it was. And I remember exactly at that moment going, that's definitely for me. I might not do it right this minute, but it's definitely, it sounded really interesting to me, and I, I, I responded immediately. Scientology answers a lot of basic questions people have. Who they are, where they're going in life, what their purpose in life is. There's many different ways that Scientology is able to help someone attain their goals or give, give them stability. They're tools, and they're tools uh, to which one can actually use, whether you study them or you get help uh, by the tools being used on you. It kept me. It's 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 the reason that I am, that I'm that I know who I am, and I I, you know, am comfortable with myself and am relatively sane. <laughs> she woke up a different person at 13 years old, of which I never expected, and it does happen, and I wasn't quite prepared for it. Um, she did dabble in drugs. I find it very fascinating how people love to talk about how I had this drug problem. Let's just get into that now because that is the most insane. <clears throat> like every I, I read things and it's like drug this, drug, travel with drugs. She was this, she was that. You know. I had like a two-year, three-year period where I was experimenting when I was from 14, 15, 16. Normal, typical age range, time period. I haven't touched a drug since any of that. Now, I'm 37 years old right now. Can we get over this, you know? She's the first person to tell you, I'm black, I'm dark, because I did all these drugs. <laughs> you know? So um, we don't have conversations about it. I've just watched her from a very young age sort of blossom into this. She was always amazing and terrific, but she was her own worst enemy. Um, that's probably, she probably still is her own worst enemy, but not, but so light years from where she was, you know? I was a lost soul for a while. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no purpose in my life. I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. And, uh, you know, finding myself, I was doing things that were destructive, and it was a three or four year period, and I had basically just had it doing that. I just got sick of it. It was really simple. I was never addicted to anything. We, you know, we've been through ups and downs. You know, she was going through a very rough, rough time. She basically threw me out in the middle of the night. You know, one night, I get out. She drove me to the church one night, and sort of dumped me off to them, and they were like, what do we do with her? <laughs> it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was in hysterics because she threw me out. But I was actually happy about it because I got independent at that point and ended up having, like, a, you know, it's a nice building. And at the time, they hadn't renovated it yet, but I did live there um, in a really tiny little apartment. And... um had my own apartment and, and had my freedom and lived in Hollywood for a little while. Now, let's not embellish the Hollywood thing, because I, I was pretty designated to an area there. I never really was all over the place, but I did live there for about eight months. Lisa met Danny Keo, a young musician at a Scientology course. After a few years of on-again, off-again dating, they were married in May 1988. Nine months later, Danielle Riley, their first child, was born. Somehow in my life, I knew um, at 20 years old, actually earlier, that Danny was the man I was having my children with. And I don't know how I knew that. I just knew he was the one, he was the right one. And he was gonna be the person that I would be okay to be connected to for the rest of my life, regardless what happens with us. It was like this prophetic thing I knew at, you know, 19. And her kids and her are 
Her kids are the most important thing in the entire universe to her, period. She's become an incredible mother. She's got just the right amount of discipline. You know, she's a, a tough mom, but in such a loving way. She just lets her kids know that everything is for them. I think those children saved her life. She's a very caring person, and she loves to, she loves to dote. She's like Mother Earth. She protects kids, and she takes care of her kids, makes sure they have the best, and even the people that work for her. Uh, she makes sure their, their kids are taken, well taken care of. She's really, really sweet with her children, you know? Like I said, Marie, Lisa Marie's sort of like, whoop, 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 whoop. But with her children, she's very gentle and very, um, really, really affectionate. She gives them loads of time. They're always with her. That's what having children allowed me to see, was that I am responsible for this being, for this person right here, and how they grow up and how they see things. I think that's part of the thing with being a mother that, that's so incredible to watch about her. She's very selfless. She sort of always was. She had much more care for other people than I think she had of herself. I feel like anybody could relate to that song, whether they like it or it's too mean or it's not nice or it's whatever it is. <laughs> it's, it is. It's not nice. And not, you're not always going to feel nice in life. And you are going to be angry and people are going to piss you off. And yeah, I think that people would be, you know, if you really want to hear a good angry go to hell song, that's a good one. <laughs> it's irreverently mean. Yeah. It's really mean. She listened as a young little girl like an artist. I remember uh, her calling me one day. I was at my office, and uh, she was in her car, and she said, I think I can sing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was kind of cute. Lisa was reluctant to record at first. I just knew she had you know, these big shoes to fill. And um, I just didn't want her in any way to go on you know, not being prepared. But I definitely knew that this was, you know, she was destined. This was, you know, she was destined. Now, yes, I am who I am. I understand all that. It's connected, and I have to break through whatever else in the hell I have to break through. Danny and her started working in their, literally in their garage, uh, writing. Danny produced the stuff. Lisa was writing. Danny wrote some of the music. I took it to one major record company. I knew the A&R guy very well. I was going to lunch and I put it in my cart and tell him what it was. So I didn't want that to get confused. I wanted to make sure, because the cruelest thing could ever have happened to her, she wasn't talented to try to do this. And I was offered a production deal on that tape. Everybody was saying that's Elvis' daughter and blah, 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 blah. She wanted to be her own boss and do her own thing. The uh, record company at a party celebrating the, the signing, and which was gonna happen. And I got a call from Lisa, and she said, I can't do it. And she had always told me, though, if she, she wanted to have another child, and if she did, she was gonna put everything on hold. And uh, along comes Ben. <laughs> and it took patience to do that. And uh, she eventually, stepped out. Lisa and Danny's marriage was in trouble as Danny struggled with being called Mr. Presley. After six years of marriage, they divorced. You know, there was never any lack of love or any lack of appreciation for the other. Danny was the parent, the father of the kids, and she was going to make sure that that was an important thing, regardless of where she was in the world or at what point she was doing it. And she made sure that the kids knew who their father was. I became more adamant that whoever I'm with has to be okay with him. And even though that was a lot to ask, you know, it ended up that he has a house on this property as well, which, you know, is really amazing. Now he is my, he's in my band, which I was trying to get him to do the last time around, but he didn't want anybody thinking that he need, you know, wanted to be on my coattails or wanted to do anything. He's such a gypsy and such a pirate himself, and he's so rebellious. And it gives me great happiness. <laughs> to introduce a brand new band member. <laughs> Thank you, Andre.
Lisa shocked the world when she married Michael Jackson just 20 days after divorcing Danny. Whoever thinks whatever of me because it's based on, you know, what they read in the tabloids. So, or who I married or who I didn't marry, which I will never apologize for. I had to go through what I had to go through. I thought I explained myself kind of okay in that, you know, I don't know what to say other than what I already said. And then hopefully we can move on now. So the situation was that they had um, gotten married in the Dominican Republic and then after that, um, we moved to New York. We, we were there temporarily, but she was living in Trump Towers with um, with Michael. And we were in New York when the news broke that um, that they had gotten married because we'd kept it quiet. And so uh, it was just it was crazy. There were people, you know, all around Trump Towers trying to get in. I think at the heart of Lisa's relationship with Michael was that she truly loved him. I don't think that Lisa does anything for the press, you know, she doesn't do anything that's not based on honesty. Um, I believe that she really loved Michael at the time. He's really very interested in her. You know, he got interested in her religion, um, everything about her. So I was actually convinced as well that, that, that it was for real. And she seemed completely in love with him. And uh, it seemed like the right thing. And you have to remember, when she was a little girl, Michael Jackson was the icon of thriller. You know, this was the guy that all the little girls loved. And that's probably the Michael that she first fell in love with as a little girl, as a little fascination, a crush. And then he was probably the closest thing to Elvis. You know, he was this enigmatic performer who was the king of pop, whereas Elvis was the king of rock. And maybe in sub, some subconscious fashion, she was trying to understand her father better. She was willing to um, dedicate herself, you know, to him and, and to help him. And I think it was a hard time for her when it didn't work out. She, when he ended up not being who she thought he was, uh, that was really tough. You know, there were things, key things that happened that really sort of showed, you know, who he was. And it, it was very tough. When Lisa met Nicolas Cage at a party in 2001, it appeared to be love at first sight. Lisa was 32. Their tempestuous relationship and well-known fights were closely scrutinized in the press. Nicholas Cage didn't marry Lisa because he was a fan. You know, Lisa certainly beautiful and womanly and interesting enough on her own merit that, you know, she, she doesn't need the Presley sort of enigma behind her to attract a man. Whoever said she was just, you know, a new piece of Elvis memorabilia was, um, it was just, it's just not true. She has an allure. She is Elvis's daughter. She does look like him. She is very interesting. And um, I know that he was in love with that person and um, not, you know, some trophy wife. You know, she's way too hard to get as a trophy wife. You know, I'll never actually forget that when she was getting married to Nicholas, we were in Hawaii planning the wedding and it came out on the cover of People magazine that Lisa and Nick had broken up. We were planning the wedding. Nick was like coming the next day and they were getting married. But the press said that they were apart and no longer there. And we were roaring. How perfect, you know, what a coup. And we actually got them to that level and and, and that's the level where they're at. And the public has no clue. And so she's lived with that since she was a baby. to one song a little bit because uh, she told me that um, it was sort of inspired by a day I walked in the studio when she was recording with uh, Linda Perry and um, I brought my daughter in and um, she said that the song that my daughter had sort of inspired this song uh, uh, called Thanks. Anyway, he brought her to the studio and he sat her down in my lap and I was sitting there playing with her and all of a sudden I, I just became overwhelmed with um, this sort of uh, appreciation and love for my, I have a very small circle of friends that are very close that I sort of feel like I live my life with. My dad had the Memphis Mafia, and he's just got us. <laughs> we don't even have a name. The Blowhole, that's our name. I live in a compound where there's several people that live on it with me. 
and I'm a really happy like that, living like that, you know? It's funny because I was just watching this documentary that's coming out on my father, and I realized that that, that is something that was absolutely handed down. Like, I've basically got a mini, you know, a mini Graceland mafia set up. <laughs> Not really. I mean, he had much more. I was also raised in that as well, so it wasn't like, it, it, that's not, um, you know, I was used to that. I was used to being at Grace and tons of people, and I knew them all, and it was something that was very, um, that I was very comfortable around at a young age. But I didn't realize that that's kind of what I've, you know, um, subconsciously built for myself as well. In 1999, Lisa led a protest march in Washington, D.C. against the drugging of children in schools. I can't help but notice that um, I've never seen a good product of um, psychiatric drugging of anybody. Lisa is very outspoken on that. If you don't give the kids drugs, um, that's almost like a crime. I don't believe in drugging people. I don't believe especially in doing that to kids. I know that that's all very popular in our current culture, but I am not interested. I, it makes me very upset. We're not, we're not very good at chanting and protesting and holding signs. I, I think we're very good at probably one-on-one -on -one or, you know, speaking to Congress. In 2002, Lisa was invited to testify in front of Congress. I walked right into the, the eye of the storm, and I found it very fascinating that, you know, these congressmen we're thankful that I came there. What is basically happening is that we are relying on a chemical to change the mood of a child. At least one of these drugs is more potent than cocaine, and we are turning them into drug addicts at a very young age. My hope is that the committee will recommend legislation that prevents school personnel from coercing parents into placing their children onto mind-altering drugs. They become dependent on them. It was on a huge high because it was, it was like, they were thankful, they were like, you know, they listened, we made changes, and from that testifying, you know, we, we changed the state of affairs in, in schools. You live in a town where there's a lot of people out there who like to latch on to people who are celebrities or, you know, in a, in a position where you're very vulnerable. Both of us have been in that position. When I'm going out here to promote this record, I have to now explain to you all these things that I've done in my life because I have this whole thing that started and, and you know this whole um, image of the tab the tabloids like me I don't know what their deal is with me I really don't and I don't and I also never realized how many people read them and how off and how big of a circulation they have people read and they believe these things that's why they're doing what they do and I am some source of interest to them I don't know why. Being a celebrity, there's this whole process that she undergoes of people constantly, you know, uh, um, you know, digging through, digging through her stuff, basically, you know, her stuff of all kinds. You know, the newspapers would follow her out. In fact, she dated some guy that set up, he got paid to set up to take her to this park. And they just, the two of them laying around, talking, kissing and stuff like that. And all these pictures end up on the... National Enquirer, I think it was, and he must have got a lot of money for it. But that's what I'm saying. That's a horrible thing. You think about this guy, supposed to be my boyfriend and stuff, but yet, you know, these guys are taking pictures of him. And when you're her growing up in the Star, the Enquirer, these gross, you know, magazines, you can't, when you go out to say, hey, this is who I am, in front of a microphone and a, you know, on a TV show, people just poo poo it because obviously that's not the truth, because the star said it wasn't, because the star said you were an alien from a different planet with four kids. Like, when I'm writing, I'm sitting here going, I'm going to write about the tabloids, I'm going to write about the paparazzi, or I'm going to be upset at, you know, being a celebrity. You know? I can't fathom what it would be like to wake up on a, every Thursday morning when the mags come out and realize that, uh, you know, some picture's been doctored and you're 400 pounds. I, I, I don't understand it. And I know, she, I know it drives her crazy, but what are you going to do? She's used to it at this point. She wrote one for me, actually, that I really like called Raven. I handed her the lyrics and she read it and then she was, you know, in shock and she was crying and, um, and then she wanted to hear it a few more times and then, you know, that became her favorite song, as it would. <laughs> and then I, um, based on that, you know, and how happy it made her and how emotional she got, I decided to try and make it go onto the record. 
she surprised me with it. So I, you know, I, I obviously I like that song. <laughs> Aside from being very grateful of who I am and, you know, um, and proud of that, I want to feel like I'm contributing. I can't just live, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't exist well just being famous or just being a celebrity or being recognized or being in the, you know, rag mags or whatever, you know, I'm, I don't, that doesn't give me any sort of satisfactory feeling inside. Um, I want to feel like I'm contributing to people. Lisa Marie credits me probably wrongly so of being a, the impetus for her to really get going because she was playing me some demos and she was like no, I don't know this that and this that and I think I said something to her like look the microphone comes past once okay and right now it's right there for you you either speak into it or you don't then it moves on and you're done so get with it or don't get with it and of course she got with it in a big way do you like the lyrics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it now, I figured it I out now. It now. Thank you. Her soul would have never rested if she hadn't have done it. When Lisa was ready to record, she sought out the best producers in the business. So uh, the big question for any artist is what are your goals? Uh, do you just want to be famous? In this case, it didn't matter because she was already famous. And how willing are you to uh, accept criticism or direction or encouragement? And I... Uh, I got a resounding sort of affirmative to, uh, to the idea that she really did want to, to express herself. To Whom May Concern was an album in progress for about five years. I think that, that one was the same thing that, that, that it is to me now. Music is music, it's just always affected me. And I wanted to be able to try to affect others with it. She could be very poetic, and I was always striving to at least make sure that that poetry was in the service of of an idea. When you really get to the place where you're telling the truth in your writing, uh, it, one feels much lighter when it's done. To whom it may concern was very much, very obviously, a, a relationship saga. It was mostly about working through all the various relationships and and, and, and making sense of them. Sometimes um, with a lot of anger and sometimes uh, with forgiveness. This is her writing and her music and her words and her feelings are very much her. She's got it, you know, she's got what her dad had. And uh, she's either got something else too that I think uh, you will be shocked and excited by when you see it. Very sultry, very, very sexy tone, one of my favorite tones in a voice. The music really has to fit around that properly to accentuate and to support it. She's got great style and you can't manufacture that. You can't do it with Pro Tools. You can't do it with Auto-Tune. You can't. You either have the great tone and style or you don't. To Whom It May Concern came out to positive reviews and eventually went gold. Lisa didn't have very much of a ramp up with the first record. I had to sort of stumble my way through everything. You know, talk shows for the first time, you know, this, that, uh, live, uh, people staring at me, people looking at me while I'm singing, which I had never had before. And in the end, I kind of forgot why I did it all because it was just like, can you stop with this? Like, do I have to, first it's live and Good Morning America first, first gig, and then, set, you know, America, not just Good Morning Wichita, but Good Morning America. <laughs> so I'm like, can we have some kind of ladder here? And then... I go from that to like, you know, other talk shows to this, that, to no, okay, now you're going to do Divas Live and you're going to do a song that you've never sung, sung before in your life and you're going to be on stage with all these amazing singers and I'm going, okay, I should have played small clubs for a while, you know, and done it the right way. Performing is essentially a lot different from making a record. I mean, in a, you're making a record, you're in a relatively hermetically sealed environment and everything sounds a lot better with touring and hotels and sound checks and maybe the you know every venue is different i'm not sure that that's enormously appealing to her and then at the end was when i actually got to see when i was on tour what it was all about which was people were coming to hear the songs yes there was a few you know gawking factors you know particularly at casinos <laughs> if we had to do casino shows you know they 
just get a free ticket and they think, oh, Presley, so, you know, I'm going to come watch her. Or, hey, maybe she's going to wear a white jumpsuit or I don't know what they're thinking. But, you know, they basically kind of come. And that tends to be when that when that's high, but those gigs pay a lot. So <laughs> they help pay for the tour. And that was the one time I went, okay, um, this is not fun. But it is fun to see people in an audience singing my songs and knowing that by the way they're singing them and by their expressions on their faces that it has moved them and they know them and they're serious about it. Those faces make me continue. I think it shows a lot of promise in terms of her career to, you know, to have a gold record first time out. The second verse is, you know, can we film the operation? Is the head dead yet? And all the boys in the newsroom have a running bet. Get the widow on the set when he's dirty laundry. That describes to me exactly what the state of affairs is right now in America. Television uh, entertainment. Our, our source of entertainment is watching other people in their darkest hour and watching other people's demise. That's what we do. And I think that that's what that song is about. That's why I picked it, because it's so out of control right now that... Um, that it's an important subject matter to bring up and in the video it will be shown that that's what I'm talking about I'm not talking about myself I'm not saying oh I'm a whiny what was me I'm a celebrity and I'm so upset because there's cameras no I don't like them when I'm not asking for them but that's not that's not at all the reason that I did this song so I just didn't want that to be misinterpreted in any way I, I'm, I enjoy the fact that it's kind of more of a funk version of the song and it's kind of gritty and, and I think it matches her voice really well Whatever is thought of as cool or whatever, I hate it immediately. <laughs> so I have to say that I do come up with my best songs when I'm angry at that subject. Um, a lot of them were on the last record, and funnily enough, um, people thought that those were about relationships, and, and 9 out of 10, they weren't. It's, you know, usually me, like, raising my middle finger to ideas that I don't like or agree with, or groups of people, or a group thought. Lisa is a very uh, uh, complex individual, and that's what makes her very, very colorful. Uh, she's you know, more or less in your face. She tells it like it is. That's the part that I like, and, and when we talk, we, we get each other face like sister and brother. You know, uh, even though I'm a you know pastor and a minister, she could she could care less. You know, she could care less if I was the pope or the president. She's just that kind of a person, and you you have to admire someone who has that kind of confront and some that kind of communication ability. Whatever well, she says, that's it. You know, she was no BS artist. You know, you have to to she get to forgive her in many ways because she just blurts things out and it used to upset me and and I used to get oh my god why did you say that what are you saying people aren't, aren't gonna understand that comment you know and she you know she, oh mom you know you're too serious and and she's you know got a way about her that's quite endearing she said what the hell is going on with you I said well, what do you mean she said, well, you're moping around and you're not being yourself and you're acting like a whip dog. What the hell's going on? And I, I went, well, I don't know. I get a whoa, whoa, you know, and then I sort of broke down and, and she said, well, that's it on this. You better get that fixed and I'm going to help you and whatever it takes. And she's very determined, you know, and she's very helpful in a way, but it wasn't like, sweetie, what's going on? What's happening, sweetie? She doesn't talk like that, you know. Elvis had a, an incredibly irreverent sense of humor. And she has that same kind of vinegar. Lisa Marie is fabulously unpredictable, meaning you don't know what her reaction is going to be to something. You don't necessarily know what she'll like or not like. She's very much her own person. So funny. I'm sorry. She cut right through the bullshit, and there was a lot of truth in her eyes and her energy, and they're, they're just... She wasn't like, hi, it's so good to meet you. She's like, yeah, whatever. Let's talk. I'm like, yeah, I like you. I can relate. Shyness to me. More about how it came to be. Because it, it was never the sort of thing where, oh, you should meet Lisa Murray, you guys should do a song together. It wasn't supposed to happen, it just did. And that's my favorite way of, of things in the world, you know, coming together.
she just was singing this beautiful melody and I heard these background kind of counterparts and I just started singing. I was waiting for her to kick me, <laughs> tell me to shut up because it was her song. I just didn't shut up and she didn't kick me. And to me, the most important line in the song is I take care of the vultures with a glass of wine. That was, that's my favorite line and it's probably one of my top five lines. I think she wanted to do another record because she really likes, she really likes writing and singing. You know, has something to say. And, and is, is very much motivated at a core level to do that. who I am and I'm I'm very much an individual and I don't like to just rock the boat because it's fun I, I just don't like to be part of a status quo her focus on being her own person her own style her own creativity and the courage to take that out you know with this this intense glare of comparison um, on her is uh, is really remarkable she's very strong She's a little piece of leather, but well put together. <laughs> I did sort of make my own thumbprint. Yeah, it was a sloppy one, and it might be even sloppier the next round. <laughs> but at least it was mine.